Today, I want to take some time and tell you about my perspective on digital advertising and where the field is going, and also tell you about the data science of digital advertising, because data science is really prevalent in this field. And uh, whether you know it, uh, digital advertising is uh, it's a $130 billion industry worldwide uh, as of last year. And um, data science permeates all aspects of this. And so it is the $100 billion equation that we're going to talk about as well. So um, I should mention that uh, I have some, some, some stuff. So this is a backpack uh, uh, that NativeX makes. And um, if you scan this QR code here, you can get a chance to win this. And uh, in addition, I've got some other little chat skis as well that I can hand out uh, for your questions or your answers. So you, you're welcome to ask questions anytime during the presentation. And if you don't ask questions, I'll ask you questions. So it's your choice. Um, <coughs> so all right. Um, <coughs> as Kevin mentioned, NativeX is a small startup. Um, it's, based, it's headquartered in Minnesota with an office in San Francisco. And we're about 130 people. And this year, we hope to hire another 40 people. And of that uh, a collection of people we want to hire, we want to hire four data scientists and uh, data engineers. And we're also looking for internship uh, candidates as well. So if you or your friends are interested in uh, uh, working at a very uh, high energy startup uh, in the mobile advertising space, then you should contact me. Um, and that would be great. So as Kevin said, um, you know, I, I've, I've done lots of different things in my career to date. And um, I think the common theme here is that I've always looked at artificial intelligence. I started off working in expert systems. Who, who here knows about expert systems? Anybody? Some of you. Yes, they are a dinosaur, I guess. So spent a lot of time trying to build expert systems. And I uh, quickly realized that that was not a scalable industry. And so started looking at alternatives. And uh, lo and behold, data and machine learning cropped up as a viable means to build uh, expert systems. And so I've been doing this for the last 20, 25 years at a variety of places throughout the world. So today, <coughs> I'd like to structure my talk as follows. So first of all, I'd like to give you my perspective on data science. And then I'd like to talk about the art and science um, of data science at NativeX, where we do native advertising. And, um, and, and then get into the details of how we tackle the $100 billion uh, equation. Um, results are important, but if you can't communicate them to uh, your peers or to your bosses uh, or CEOs, then they really don't have much value. And so visualizing them and art articulating them is really important. Um, I want to tell you about a competition that has been running uh, over the last year in uh, online advertising. Um, sometimes uh, people uh, approach me and say, hey, you know, I'm in academia. It's sometimes very difficult to get access to data or to really understand what's going on in industry, especially in advertising. People don't want to share um, problems or data. And uh, well, here's an example, a counterexample to that, where um, a company in China uh, made available a data set for, for the purposes of optimizing uh, various advertising opportunities. So I'll talk about that at the end and then draw some conclusions. So uh, music and the fashion industry is not the only place where rock stars and supermodels co-mingle. Um, I, I think that uh, I'll, tell you, I'll give you my definition of a rock star shortly. But, uh, and then I'll tell you, we, we do live in the era of supermodels. Um, we have hugely complex uh, um, models or, uh, or functions of variables that help us predict a variety of things. And um, so for me, uh, data science is, is merely, uh, it's, a, it's a relatively new discipline in some ways. And um, it's a beautiful combination of technology, business, and mathematics. So for me, technology is about uh, being able to hack up code uh, in terms of Linux, Hadoop, um, Python, R, and so on. And then um, it's also nice to have some solid math training in terms of statistics, probability theory, operations research, and so on. And without domain expertise, uh, really, this does not really work that well. And um, uh, here we're talking about mobile advertising in particular. Uh, maybe having some background in economics and econometrics also helps a lot. And um, if you have these three skill sets, then in my eyes, you're a true rock star. 
And that's the kind of people that we want to um, hire. And these are the sort of teams we want to build out there. And um, if we look at uh, society uh, in general, um, we find data science permeating all aspects of what we do, including uh, voting. So Barack Obama leveraged data science to, uh, to quite a, a big effect uh, over the last presidential campaign, where he used it for the purposes of um, uh, raising um, a whole bunch of money, a billion dollars in money, and also figuring out how to predict and persuade voters so essentially, um, Barack Obama, like others in industry, defined some SMART goals. So SMART goals for, our, for us are specific objectives, measurable, assignable actions, realistic, and time-related. And these are important when it comes to industry. Um, and so for Bar Barack Obama, his uh, SMART goal was uh, essentially to get to 270 electoral votes. And to do that, he had a lot of money available, and he had volunteers. And he had three main tasks that he needed to um, pursue. And he used uh, data science um, um, to predict uh, voter registration, to help him voter registration, uh, help persuade voters to come and, and vote uh, for his party and his uh, uh, ticket, and then also to model turnout. Um, and so um, I think the, the result uh, of winning the election showed, um, bodes very well for data science. And, um, in doing this, he leveraged about 80 pieces of information about each person. Believe it or not, there's a lot of information out about, there about you. If you're a citizen of the US, then there's a lot of information that's available publicly about who, who you are and how you vote and so on. And um, probably some of you here are political scientists and know this already. So data science also permeates sports. Uh, you all remember the movie uh, Moneyball, uh, where Billy Bean um, the Oakland Athletics uh, baseball uh, manager. He used uh, data mining and data science to build uh, a world-class baseball team from a, a shoestring budget. And of course, there's uh, Nate Silver, who uh, used uh, uh, Bayesian techniques to predict the outcome of the, the, the last two presidential elections in the US. Of course, it, it also permeates uh, dating, uh, um, match.com and other aspects of our life as well. So where we are just generating huge volumes of data and we're just only beginning to understand um, how to leverage this data. So <coughs> advertising is also uh, a field where uh, data science is being leveraged quite a bit these days. And so if you didn't know, advertising makes up about 2% of GDP in North America. And it has done so for the last hundred years, which is an amazing fact, I feel. And um, so if you feel that like advertising is going away anytime soon, uh, I think you should think again. So um, worldwide, digital advertising today is about $130 billion. And I think that maybe about $100 billion <laughs> of that uh, is definitely influ influenced or affected by uh, data science practices. Um, and we'll talk about some of those shortly. Now, one of the biggest trends in digital advertising today is mobile advertising. So I think we're all spending increasingly more time on our mobile devices, such as uh, your phones, smartphones, or your um, uh, tablet uh, computers. And so uh, apparently, um, as of last year, um, people are spending more time on their um, mobile devices than on uh, desktop devices, and, um, on, on average. And if we look at mobile advertising, um, uh, in here, and this is in the US here, uh, in 2016, um, the amount of money spent in mobile advertising will surpass um, desktop advertising, which is a, a pretty incredible uh, growth rate. And so the US certainly uh, reflects the rest of the world in, in these numbers as well. And I just want to make a short mention of what we do at Native X and how that all ties in here. So when we think about advertising, we think of a, a supply-demand uh, ecosystem. And uh, we also think of the consumer here. Um, so essentially, um, we have supply here in terms of publishers who have real estate where they can show ads. And they want to monetize from that uh, capability. And they want to connect um, to advertisers who create a demand to show their ads to consumers. 
So essentially, advertising about is about taking um, uh, advertisers taking a message um, through their publishers into the consumers here, and. Um, and uh, native X uh, gets to play on the supply side. So we have this idea of supply side and demand side. And uh, demand side is all about supporting the advertisers and optimizing for their value, whereas supply side is more about looking at the publishers and trying to figure out how do we make more money um, and make the consumers even happier. Um, and so native X lies somewhere on the supply side and on the intersection of these two um, parts of the ecosystem. The, and, and as I say, NativeX also focuses more on the mobile uh, side of the business as well. And so it's a, crowded, it's a very crowded landscape. Here's just one version of the mobile adverti advertising uh, ecosystem. And there are lots of different players in here. Some of these we'll recognize, and some of, those, some of these will be very small startups that, make, uh, that you probably haven't seen before. Uh, in addition, NativeX focuses on the gaming uh, aspect of, of, of mobile computing. Um, uh, we, we work a lot with, uh, with uh, game publishers, and we try to monetize for, for games on, on uh, mobile platforms. So over the last 12 months, if you want to know what's hot in the field of digital advertising, these are some of the keywords that kind of come to mind. So native advertising is a big one. Uh, big data is another big one. Real-time predictions, social mobile shift, and so on. And um, when we're looking at uh, data science, um, it doesn't just exist in a vacuum. There's a whole ecosystem that needs to support it, and infrastructure, and so on. And so here, I've just laid out some of those uh, uh, components, ranging from you know, uh, Hadoop file systems, to relational databases, to various analytical platforms, to visualization tools, to real-time scoring, to lifetime value modeling, um, and then uh, some vertical solutions for a ver variety of domains. And typically, we're interacting with a very uh, big variety of devices, ranging from desktop TVs to tablet computers and so on. So the one thing that has really uh, been interesting to watch over the last, say, five years is the following. Um, uh, we've seen a lot of companies invest heavily in warehousing data. And it was only until recently that data was just warehoused, and uh, it wasn't leveraged. Uh, people did some very simple stuff, such as generating summary statistics and reports. And then based upon that, they made certain big decisions. And, and so if we look here, we've got the x-axis here, which is looking at um, a timeline, basically. And on the y-axis here, we have some key performance I indicator. Uh, and in, and in this case here, it could be sales or sales improvement. And so when we leverage these uh, data warehouses for summary statistics, for, for summary st statistics, we generally see improvements in our K KPIs of, of 10 to 20 percent. Now, if we go a little bit further and um, we leverage that data in a kind of a data mining, machine learning, batch uh, uh, learning approach, um, we can squeeze out a further improvement here. And, but it's not until we get to real-time decision-making here, where we process every decision in real time, that we see some massive gains. Uh, we're seeing 2 to 10x uh, gains by having real-time decisions. And we'll see some examples of real-time decisions shortly in the advertising ecosystem. And if we go beyond um, this real-time decision-making into uh, personalization and lifetime value modeling, then we can get upwards of, of 10x improvement here. And so um, until recently, we were stuck back here. And now we're kind of getting here, and we certainly have a lot of this going on as well, uh, certainly in the bigger companies uh, out there. OK, so with all this excitement and hype, I would say, uh, it's created a lot of demand for people like you, data scientists. And uh, this is a report done by McKinsey, uh, I think, three years ago. And they were pro they're projecting that there's a need of about 150,000 data scientists today in the, uh, in the US alone. And that translates also into a, 1 um, um, a demand of 1.5 million managers or analysts. So that's a lot of uh, demand for, for people like you. And so it's a great time to be alive. And um, uh, that's, there's a lot to be done. So uh, hurry on and get your degrees and come on out to industry. Um, so having said that, I should say that at, at NativeX, um, we have a number of opportunities, uh, both at the data science level, 
um, and, and also in terms of data engineers and also in terms of interns. So we would love for you to come work with us in San Francisco or Minnesota. Um, and we got tons of data, and um, we've got some cool um, tech stack as well, and some great clients in, in the gaming world in particular. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about the art and science of uh, digital advertising in the mobile context. Um, so when we think about advertising, we think um, about um, trying to create awareness about a product. Um, in this case, maybe it's maybe an app that a person should install. Uh, then we try to model some intent, and hopefully we get the consumer to install that app. And, um, and we do this using a combination of art and science. Having installed the app, you want to understand the level of engagement by that consumer. Because you just don't want somebody to install the app and never come back to the app. You want to understand uh, the level of engagement, what's the lifetime value associated with that consumer, and, um, and, and and this is a relatively new phenomenon. Um, in the case of digital advertising until now, uh, people could understand uh, awareness, maybe intent, and maybe um, um, install or, or, or purchase uh, actions. But subsequently, people could not understand loyalty. Um, they didn't have access to the data. But uh, at this time, um, in the mobile context, we are getting increasingly more access to uh, consumer behavior after the purchase, which is opens up a whole bunch of new problems that previously um, uh, people dreamt about, I guess. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, NativeX, we are uh, on, the, um, uh, on the supply side. We are optimizing primarily for publisher uh, monetization purposes. And uh, we've gone through maybe, let's say, four iterations or four generations of online advertising to date. And so the first generation was back in the uh, mid-90s. And uh, here, um, in terms of digital advertising, it was more taking offline practices, um, such as uh, two martini lunches and uh, cost per 1,000 impression business models um, that were prevalent in the offline world, in the newspaper world, in the TV world. Uh, people met, discussed pricing over lunches, and they dealt in terms of well, I'll give you ten dollars for um, for uh, a thousand uh, people seeing my ad. And so, typically in the advertising industry, we deal in units of one thousand because it uh, makes for more interesting numbers. And um, so, back then, the the first generation was really just taking offline practices and making them available online. And uh, you had companies like Gap.com; um, they would advertise on various uh, websites. Um, even though they didn't have a website of their own then. So it was kind of a very early days, very cavalier, uh, and so on. So the second generation of uh, online advertising was a little bit different. Um, people started to build new business models that were more tailored towards um, digital advertising. So uh, what we came up with there was the cost per click business model that uh, is still a very prevalent model and cost per action uh, business model. And we also started to warehouse data and trying to understand the, how, how to model conversion rates and, and click-through rates. And about, um, let's say, seven or eight years ago, uh, a whole new generation of online advertising came into being. And that focused primarily on personalization and, um, and leveraging data about consumer behavior. And so we have this idea of behavioral targeting. So we can understand maybe your intent uh, if you're going on a business trip we, may can we can discern that you're going on a trip and maybe help um, um, target ads which are more appropriate for you at that time. Um, and so um, I think the fourth generation is more about native advertising. It's about creating an experience that is not too disruptive to your current activity and that is more memorable. And we can see this um, in, in the case of Facebook, for example. We have all these news streams, and embedded in these news streams are our ads. And these are just interleaved like the other news stories here. Um, at NativeX, we've taken this a little bit further. Uh, and so we're um, generating native ad experiences in the context of games. And so here's a game here. And, and, and now uh, maybe this, this is a, a game where we're going from one level to the next level, and we're going to show an ad. We just don't show a, a banner ad. 
we get the ca a character in the game to actually spray paint this ad onto the screen. And so this is a much more engaging experience and a much more native experience. And we find um, that it just brings a lot of value to uh, our publishers. And publishers are, exciting about this, are excited about this new experience um, for uh, consumers. So we get to have lots of controls that enable uh, publishers to control the experience and also advertisers. And um, when we're um, building these um, uh, experiences, there are lots of questions that the, d the designers have to go through. Um, so, for example, which character should introduce, introduce the ad? How should we uh, unveil the ad? Um, uh, what thickness, what colors, and so on. And so we've got all these uh, user interface um, decisions and, 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 and interaction decisions that we need to make. And so the question is, how do we uh, decide which combinations of uh, native advertising should we actually embrace for a particular context? And um, here we're using um, techniques based upon design of experiments or fractional factorial design and, uh, and uh, amongst other things as well. And so, yes? So this could be that the designers of the game and the artists that they're bringing together or at least the, I, I think of advertising as a negative function of the sticker line. Mm -hmm. So if they're owned by two sets of companies, so suppose one company designed the game and they want users to have you know, the best experience. Mm -hmm. It's a good question. And so I think I'm going to give you a prize. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, I mean, I'll give you uh, something more. Actually, this might be. That's OK. There'll be a lot of questions. <laughs> oh, I'm sure there will be now. Uh, sorry. I just got to get the right size here. But we've got different sizes, so. Make it a bit more interactive here. Uh, great question. Okay, so I think that um, um, we work with uh, clients such as Sega, Kilu, um, Candy Crush. Uh, these are all big gaming players, Zynga as well. And um, at the end of the day, they are all big publishers. They have game designers and creators. They've got a big staff, big payroll. And um, they can pay their staff. Um, through a number of ways, I guess. One is that they can charge for each game. And, um, or they say, well, it's free, and we're just going to uh, monetize through various um, advertising experiences. And so a lot of games today are, f are shifting away from uh, paid uh, gaming to maybe a freemium type model. And um, so that's kind of where we are at right now, I guess. There's, there's the, the publishers, the gamers, they are very motivated to make money. They need to make money. And so they see advertising as one of the key forces to enable them to, to, uh, to survive, I guess. So it just seems to be an intrinsic value. Yes. So instead of spending it, it's a great cost of the game. You can now send people to download it for free mm -hmm. and incorporate the advertising into it. Sure. And so there are two forms of advertising in games. One is uh, the traditional, let's say, kind of banner ad type experience. And the other is um, through um, sort of um, um, some currencies that they build into the game. So there, there are um, um, you have the ability to purchase uh, items in the game that help you accelerate your progress through the game. So this idea of in-app purchases, which is also a big uh, field. And, and again, there again, you get to optimize that experience as well. And so we are uh, doing both at Native X. Mm -hmm. 
the game. Mm-hmm. Now, is that in some way connected to advertising at a current status like Coca-Cola or something like that? Or just advertising the opportunity to monetize the free experience and upsell yourself within the context of the game itself? So I think that there are a couple of things. So um, first of all, um, a lot of the um, games, they will choose to work with other apps or so advertise other apps. Those apps can sometimes be other gaming apps. They can also be brand type uh, apps like uh, Expedia or Hotels.com or Procter Gamble um, and so on. So there's um, definitely uh, a combination of both uh, in the advertising. And so then the in-app purchases, that's a whole other um, way of uh, monetization. And um, so I, I think Candy Crush, they've done very well and we certainly work with them. Uh, we are one of, uh, of, 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 of a, a few, I think. There's only a few uh, companies that they work with. We're basically an ad network, and um, they've partnered with us. So I think I'm going to give you something useful. Um, OK, so anyway, getting back, um, there are all these decisions uh, that one has to make um, as a designer of a user experience when it comes to advertising. So at the end of the day, um, when we're uh, advertising online, we're all about improving the revenue for um, the publisher. We're uh, all about optimizing the return on investment uh, by the advertiser. And then, of course, we want to somehow enhance the consumer experience as well. So when it comes to monetization, um, if I'm a, a game publisher, there are various ways I can make money. And I just talked about the in-app purchases uh, as one way, um, and then there's advertising. But, um, so as, an, as, a, as a publisher, I need to figure out uh, where I can get ads, and then I need to figure out which ads I should show in a, a particular context. So let's say you're going from level one to level two in a gaming context, or you're just restarting the game. There's an opportunity there for you to monetize that event. And so uh, as, a, as a publisher, you need to figure out, well, which of these ads we should show here? And so what could be a good way to uh, sort through these ads? And, and pick one to show the consumer. This is a chance to win a t-shirt. <laughs> so how, which, which ad, uh, how do I cho chose, uh, choose which ad is shown to the publisher, to the advertiser, to the consumer here? Possibly, yeah, that's good. Go ahead. Uh, maybe like collecting data about the user, so you have like these parity buckets where other ad <coughs> tracks and users can share these tracks back to bid out for their specific interaction. Do you want this? Yes, okay. So I guess there, there are a whole variety of schemes, and we could be here until the cows come home to uh, enumerating them. But um, uh, essentially, uh, what we have about each ad at this point is um, we're operating, say, in a, in a cost per action business, business model or cost per install. So we're showing uh, maybe uh, apps, um, and we want you to install the app. And if you install the app, I, as an advertiser, will pay you, say, $10 or $5. So there's this notion of cost per install that I will tell you, um, tell you the publisher. And so we could just temp simply uh, um, take the argmax of the of the bid prices uh, associated with um, um, uh, with the um, sorry, Ooh. that's not good. Sorry, my PowerPoint just crashed. I'm just have to. It's taking a while to reboot here. Okay. Anyway, we'll just continue. Uh, uh, it'll be back in a minute. So, um, so basically, we can say, hey, let's serve ad, ads based upon the highest bidder. And so do you think that's a reasonable business model? Uh, operate, uh, is it a reasonable way to uh, serve ads? Or what, what do you feel? Go ahead. Sure. Okay. So, okay. So I'm hearing that th there's potential weakness in this uh, highest bidder model. Okay. Don't you get it at this that you also, in some way, look at it as a reciprocal versus most likely to reap the purchase? 
Sure. You, I mean, you got a lot of information about the consumer, potentially. Um, OK, so I've got PowerPoint back. So high speeder model, I think we all see that there are some glaring flaws in it. And um, so essentially, uh, when we think about uh, advertising, um, most people don't click on ads. So typically, uh, one in 100 uh, people will click on an ad. And this example here, I'm saying um, uh, we show an ad to 20 uh, people, consumers, and one person installs. So we have a conversion rate of 5%. And, um, um, and typically, if we have a, um, a conversion rate here, uh, sorry, if we have a bid price of uh, $10, then it's 5% uh, by $10. It gives me 50 cents. My expected revenue from showing this ad to this consumer at this time is going to be 50 cents. And so in online advertising, we're always thinking in terms of uh, expected revenue or ECPM, expected costs per 1,000 impressions. We just multiply this number here by 1,000, and we've got ECPM. So it's, it's, it's the currency of digital advertising. So basically, um, we will spend our time um, selecting ads based upon the arg max of this equation here. So basically, we'll compute the expected revenue, or ECPM, for each ad. And then we'll sort based upon that, and then select accordingly. OK, um, let's change gears here. Let's talk about the, the underlying technology techniques that have been used here. And so essentially, this uh, ECPM-based uh, equation, this, this uh, um, argmax, uh, um, or this auction, this real-time auction that we conduct when we get uh, an ad call from a publisher is the $100 billion equation. Um, so I mentioned earlier on that the online advertising industry worldwide is $130 billion. So there's about $30 billion which doesn't fall into this realm here. It still kind of floats into the uh, uh, two martini lunches and, and, uh, and so on. Um, so OK, so wh what is the math uh, behind this? So people like Google, uh, Facebook, and many others um, have this uh, equation uh, very much part of what they do on a daily basis. And so um, a simple model for modeling this equation is, uh, is a SQL statement. Who here writes SQL code? Yeah, nice. <laughs> we're, we're a dying breed, but we're still alive. Uh, OK, so this, this is a very simple um, model for uh, conducting uh, an ECPM-based auction. There are two components. There's the conversion rate, there's the bid price, and then there's 1,000. And uh, so the bid price here is given by the advertiser and saying, hey, I'm happy to pay $10 for an install of my app. Uh, the conversion rate is something that we have to work on. And so here's a simple SQL statement. It's, uh, uh, we're saying, give me the number of conversions divided by the views uh, and group these according to the ad or offer ID. And here in the first row, we see that we have five conversions over 100 views. That gives us a con conversion rate of um, 5%. And um, it gives us an expected revenue of $100 for this offer here. And so this could be a very uh, effective way of serving ads. So who here is happy with this model here? You're all happy with it? That's amazing. No. OK. Why aren't you happy? OK. OK, fair enough. Yep. Makes sense. So I think you also deserve uh, <laughs> something special. Um, OK. So, so SQL, OK, great. Uh, so, but, uh, you know, in general, the world is not uh, such so abstract. We have lots of information about. Uh, the advertiser, the consumer, the, the publisher, and so on. And so basically, we can have more elaborate SQL statements. We can say, rather than just grouping by the uh, ad ID and offer ID, we can say, let's have a whole bunch of other features, such as age and geo information, latitude, longitude, and so on. But again, uh, I ask you the question, is this good enough? Would you be happy working in a company that says, hey, here's how we do business? Anybody? You're happy?
is a policy of the publisher somehow to factor in the price. Mhm. Because that that seems to be the the actual policy. Okay. All right, so I think you're articulating uh, some very, yeah, uh, limited aspects of this model here, and we'll cover those. Sorry, go ahead. It's very static. Very static, okay. It doesn't take advantage of what the person's doing. Doesn't take advantage, yes. There's a lot of, like, other things that we could fold in here. And I guess the biggest question here really is that um, we certainly can segment and we can over-segment where we get to a place where we don't have any data or very little data. So let's, if I tell you, like, oh, I have one view here, a one impression, and I've got one conversion. So that's one over one, which is a 100% conversion rate. Are you happy with that number? Probably not. And so um, we, we've got a whole bunch of uh, uh, problems that we need to face here. So which features, what level of granularity, we have sparsity issues, we've got cursor dimensionality. And so, um, so some of the things we kind of uh, deal with here, what we're trying to do really is we're trying to segment the world into zones with self, uh, with the uh, conversion rates which are very similar. And we can do this using a number of ways, and um, there's a lot of merit to, to do this. So in, in this case here, we've got a decision tree approach where we say, if we had a global conversion, sorry, if we took a look at the whole world, we'll see a conversion rate of 3.3%. But if we l zoom in, we see that in this segment here, we've got a, a conversion rate of 10%. And this contrasts in to a conversion rate of 0.5% here. So by segmenting the world in this way, we can get down to, to the regions where we can do very well for a particular ad or offer. And so our business is in the segmentation business here. And uh, um, I think we all know about confidence intervals and so on, and binomial uh, likelihoods, estimates, and so on. And so at, at NativeX, we have a, a technology stack that, um, first of all, focuses on the um, uh, native advertising experience. And secondly, that conducts a real-time auction that combines a whole bunch of uh, variables, both from our internal logs, our first party data, and also from third party data as well. And so our first party data includes uh, location information, uh, behavioral information, uh, device, type of a device, uh, and, and a bunch of, whole bunch of other features. So we've got thousands of features that we, we uh, uh, consider in the modeling of the conversion rate. And, and typically we spend our day on this, uh, on this cycle here. We're understanding our domain, we're collecting and warehousing data, we spend a lot of time feature engineering, we spend a lot of time modeling in the lab and evaluating, and finally we come up with uh, a challenger. And we deploy challengers into a production setting where we serve ads in a real-time manner and we do A-B testing. So this is our typical pipeline um, at NativeX um, for uh, advertising. And I should mention that uh, here are some of the features that we consider. Um, and here are some of the algorithms and, and problems that we face. And um, some of the things we have looked at, um, we've looked at Bayesian hierarchical models uh, amongst a whole plethora of uh, machine learning techniques. And um, I should mention that, um, you know, um, we've spent about 10,000 hours so far at NativeX in uh, leveraging data science. And I feel like we are almost experts, um, but we're, we still have a lot of work to do. So some of the work that we're looking at right now is um, building a more um, sustainable modeling framework. Uh, we're looking at scale. We have terabytes of data being generated each day. And uh, processing uh, this data takes a lot of hardware and uh, skill. We spend a lot of time feature engineering, a lot of time designing experiments. Um, one big problem we have is the cold start problem. And the cold start problem for us is um, how do we um, um, take a new campaign, new ad campaign, and how do we bootstrap that campaign? How do we know where to show this ad uh, where uh, it will get a lot of traction, a lot of positive traction? Um, and, and this is a huge issue for us. Uh, forecasting is another uh, problem for us. We need to forecast the volume of impressions that an advertiser can expect to get if they have these constraints in their campaign. So let's say you want to show the ad in North America and you have this bid price. Well, how many impressions and, and conversions can I expect based on this basis? Data visualization is important, and uh, we'll talk about other things as well. So uh, one of the things that we're really curious about is deep learning. It's definitely um, a buzzword for a lot of hype. 
Um, but uh, it's definitely a very powerful approach. And, 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 and so we're exploring this in the context of um, conversion rate modeling and other problems. And so if you are a budding intern, um, then maybe these are some of the things that you would work on. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, um, digital advertising to date has focused on this funnel and has just stopped here. Uh, hasn't had access to this kind of data. And so we're starting to work with uh, publishers that are very happy and comfortable sharing this uh, engagement data. And when you can see behind the curtain after an install, it really, uh, it's amazing what you, you learn about the, the, the consumer. Um, and typically when consumers install apps, um, a lot of them have no intention ever using the app or they forget about the app. And that's just uh, very uh, enlightening uh, and helps a lot when it comes to um, um, generating awareness in the advertising funnel. So we have a lot of work around lifetime value optimization and segmentation and churn modeling and so on. So I mentioned earlier on the coal star problem. So here's an example of the coal star problem. Here's time on the x-axis here. And here is, um, there, there are a number of things going on here. In the primary y-axis here, we have the expected um, revenue from showing this ad. And here on the right, we have the number or the volume of impressions in terms of thousands of impressions. And so this red line here, this curve here on top, shows the cumulative um, uh, ad impressions that this uh, campaign has received. And as you can see, that there's a steady um, um, delivery of ad impressions over time here, over this two-week or three-week time period. Um, this blue line here corresponds to the ECPM for this uh, offer. And as you can see, it's quite, uh, it's quite jagged. It varies quite a bit. And so initially it spikes up and then it drops back. And uh, over time, um, we see it um, sort of settle into a steady state. This green line here is the cumulative uh, ECPM uh, curve. So we'd love to get to this steady state, uh, which we define here as this black line, as quickly as possible. But in typically, it takes us uh, two or three weeks to get a campaign all fired up and, uh, and, and, and delivering uh, well. And so this is a huge challenge for us. And so we've got huge needs around this coal star problem. Forecasting is another problem. OK, um, when we are uh, presenting results, um, uh, we are presenting at different levels. Sometimes I'm talking to the CEO. Sometimes I'm talking to people like Kevin, to you. And uh, you know, what's a good way of understanding and, and, and articulating what we're learning? And uh, so here's an example of the, the purchase funnel. And um, sometimes this is a very uh, convincing slide for uh, prospective uh, publishers. Um, Typically, on the uh, mobile world, you can expect uh, eCPMs of about, about a dollar these days. And at NativeX, we are typically generating higher value uh, for based upon our um, ways of tackling advertising. So sometimes we visualize the world in terms of these world maps, and uh, we color code them for eCPMs or uh, conversion rates. Sometimes we'll show curves like this, and we'll show our progress at NativeX internally. Um, Here's a timeline over the last year. And as you can see, uh, back in um, the summer of last year, we had very low eCPMs here. And over the course of the year, we've seen our eCPMs uh, increase. And you may wonder where these uh, increases come from. And uh, it's a combination of our uh, improved targeting technology and also our native advertising experiences. Internally, good. Sure, that, that's always uh, um, um, a good point. And we always calibrate ourselves here. We're always running a, running a random model in the background so we can actually measure these effects. And so we're, we're, that's, that's a very good point, though. Um, I think I'm going to give you another uh, chachki. Um, so then as a team, as a data science team at NativeX, we're always um, um, trying to build smart goals. And we're trying to quantify and aim for something. And so here's an example. Um, this is um, Q4 of last year. Um, so we're always thinking in terms of quarters and weeks and so on. And um, we, set us up, uh, we set ourselves a goal of this red line in Q4. Um, and, and so we, we actually attained that. And so then for this Q1, we're hoping to increase uh, our relative improvement to 40% over our very high baseline. 
And um, so when we, um, so visualizing data is, 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 uh, is, is, is very important. I don't know if there are HCI people here or user experience people here. Um, it's like visualizing big data is, is really uh, a great field of research. So we'd love to hear uh, your opinions on this front. Okay, I realize that we're getting low on time here, so I'll take maybe five minutes to finish up here. Um, and of course, if you have questions, feel free to, to stop me. Um, do we have any questions so far? Go ahead. That's a great question. Um, I'm just going to give you this. Oh. Uh, excellent question. And it is something that we think about a lot. And um, so two things. First of all, we don't, um, if we see the same consumer uh, over and over, like during the next hour, we just don't show them the same ad all, all the time. We have this idea of frequency caps. We say, look, we're going to show you the ad maybe at most three times in a 24-hour period. That's one thing. Um, and then, of course, the value of an impression uh, does either increase or diminish uh, at some point. And so the first impression might be the most valuable, potentially. But maybe it's the second one that's really valuable. That's like we see. So we, we certainly calibrate for those. We fold those uh, statistics into our um, conversion rate modeling, uh, as we saw earlier on. So it's a very great question, though. But, but uh, we have one way of doing thing, things today. But I think that there are, are, there's a lot of room for improvement here um, um, in, in leveraging this type of data. OK, I want to tell you about a real-time bidding uh, competition that's happening, or is hap it's actually is, is finished for the moment. And um, so just to give you um, some more context here, um, when it comes to advertising, there are two, um, there are two primary business models. Um, there, as an advertiser, you can reserve uh, online real estate in advance. And that's called the reserve model, our guaranteed markets model. And then there's the real-time model where you get to buy things uh, in real time. And there's a perishable market. And so uh, the reserve model is pretty much more about the two martini lunch approach to uh, advertising, whereas this real-time modeling um, Real-time bidding is much more programmatic based, and, um, and we'll talk about that just very briefly. And so to facilitate this, we have this entity called an ad exchange. An ad exchange is just a marketplace where people come and sell goods and people come and buy goods. So we have the uh, advertiser coming to buy uh, real estate from the publisher, and we've got many exchanges. So, um, and then we've got these intermediaries that work on the demand side. We call them demand side platforms. And they typically represent advertisers. And they provide a programmatic way to interact with the exchanges to buy these goods. And they have this idea of a real-time bidding platform. And so they take care of which impressions to bid on and uh, what price and, and so on. So typically, uh, a real-time bidder works uh, as follows. First of all, you have the publisher who puts a code in their app or in their web page. And uh, when that page is loaded in the browser or when you fire up an app, um, a call is made to the ad exchange saying, hey, uh, a consumer has loaded the page. I have a slot here where I can show an ad. And um, typically, um, then the uh, exchange says, hey, um, it, it federates um, a bid request to all um, advertisers or demand side platforms. And, and these guys over here um, are now doing programmatic bidding. They are trying to compute the eCPM for this opportunity for, for a Flickr ad. And then they return this uh, bid in, in 100 milliseconds or less. And, um, and basically, uh, the exchange then decides which ad wins and shows that ad. So this is a whole real-time bidding platform. And it's, it's, it's pretty massive in the digital advertising world. So today, maybe 20 25% of uh, advertising is, um, is um, managed by real-time uh, bidding platforms. And I guess to just give you an, ex an example of the scale here, um, typically um, a real-time bidding platform or a demand-side platform will process uh, 1 million queries per second or requests for bids per second. That's a, that's a lot of, that's, that's, that's some 
high um, volume, high network requirements, high computational uh, effort that's involved here. So it's one million per second. And so they're really pushing the, 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 the envelope in terms of computational power and network throughput and so on. And, and the, the key is to turn this around in maybe 40 to 50 milliseconds. Um, and I, I guess the other big phenomenon here is that you have these public exchanges, but you also have a, a, this idea of private exchanges where publishers and advertisers agree to work in a private practice. And um, I want to highlight a big problem here uh, in, uh, um, in, in uh, this uh, real-time bidding pl platforms. So we just talked about how an advertiser um, or a, a, a demand side platform works on taking the bid price for an ad, generating the conversion rate, multiplying by 1,000, and this corresponds to an eCPM. Now these guys don't work for free, so we multiply these by a, a, a kind of a margin, or one minus the margin. So in this case here, the demand side platform wishes to have a 20% margin, so it's gonna just uh, deflate this number uh, to this. And, um, and then we submit a bid to the, um, to the exchange. And we either win the bid and win the auction, and we show the ad, or we don't. So we have this idea of win rates. So win rates vary from 1% to, let's say, 50 60%. And so now I, as a demand side platform, or as an advertiser, I need to figure out if I'm happy with these win rates or not. And so I have control over this margin here. So sometimes I'm happy to say, well, I don't need 20% this time around. I just need to break even because I want to learn about certain things. And so you have this whole practice about modeling the margin here. And so I guess the question is, how do you do this effectively? And so today, I think uh, very rudimentary approaches are being used. And there's a huge opportunity here to, um, to have a kind of a closed loop control system approach to mo uh, modeling the margin. And um, I haven't really seen that much uh, progress out on this front uh, in, 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 in practice or in the literature either. So some of the things that um, um, I have been looking at are more looking at Markov decision processes or reinforcement learning as a means of modulating this control, uh, this uh, um, um, uh, margin um, so that we can have a better uh, win rate and, and so on. So there's this whole idea of exploit versus explore, and there's a whole variety of approaches for doing this. Okay, quickly, uh, there was a competition. I'm just going to point you to it. Uh, I'm going to send the slides around, or you'll see the slides, I guess, online somewhere. Um, and this was a competition that was run by IPNU, and I was one of the judges in this competition. And uh, this was the objective function that was being maximized. And uh, thousands of people participated in this competition over the last year. And the, the winners will be announced this weekend. And uh, it's a great data set. And it will be made available publicly after maybe this quarter. So I would encourage you, if you are looking to look at real-time data, uh, sorry, so real-time, real-world problems um, in the real-time bidding space, um, this is a great place to, to, to uh, go to. All right, to conclude, um, we've looked at the supply-demand um, uh, ecosystem around digital advertising, uh, and NativeX plays a big role on the supply side. Hopefully these terms mean make more sense now after this presentation. And, um, we are starting to move away from the traditional funnel and starting to understand what happens after the purchase or the install of uh, apps. Data science uh, permeates all aspects of society, uh, in particular uh, online advertising. Uh, the US mobile advertising world will dwarf the desktop advertising world by 2016. And um, we're using data science to improve conversion rate prediction, um, to optimize uh, native advertising experiences, we'll, uh, using it for forecasting and lifetime uh, value modeling. And um, I should mention that we are looking for rock stars and supermodels. So please uh, come and see us uh, or talk to me, and uh, it would be lovely to have you in San Francisco or in Minnesota.